And welcome everyone. I'm Anne Hesse and I lead the Democrats Abroad Global Women's Caucus. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our guest speaker, to our Democrats Abroad members, and to all of you who have taken the time to join this call from around the world. We welcome you to today's discussion, Women Win the Winter Midterms, but now what? Well, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, Democrats Abroad is the largest organization of US citizens outside of the United States. We're also an official arm of the Democratic Party. It's our mission to provide Americans abroad with a voice in our government and to elect Democratic candidates by mobilizing the overseas vote. The Women's Caucus is the largest of the Democrats Abroad constituency groups. Our teams focus on many issues of concern to women, including equality, violence against women, economic empowerment, and more. Reproductive justice has always been at the very top of our priority list. And we know that this issue was high priority for voters in the midterms too, and will continue to be a prime concern going forward. Well, fortunately, our GWC reproductive justice team led by Sally Schwartz is always ready for action. Under her guidance, this team has grown into a powerful activist force, educating and mobilizing concerned Americans around the world. Sally has been working as a Paris-based international attorney for over 40 years and is a former GWC co-chair and DA France vice chair. She currently serves on the GWC Steering Committee and leads our Reproductive Justice Action Team. Sally will be our moderator today and will introduce our guest. Also co-hosting today is Angela Fobbs, the founder and former chair of the DA Global Black Caucus and current DA Germany Wiesbaden Chapter Chair. She serves in many other capacities as well, including work on the Global Women's Caucus Steering Committee, the DA Environment and Climate Crisis Council, and the Global IT team. She will be gathering questions for our guests from the chat box and on Zoom and on Facebook where we're streaming live now. So you're welcome to type in your questions as we go along. Now I'll hand off to Sally who will lead our discussion. Sally? Thank you, Anne. And um, I just want to remind everybody that um, Carrie will be speaking. I'm going to introduce her in a minute. If you have any questions, just type them in or um, raise your hand and you will be called on to ask your question. This is uh, supposed to be a discussion um, and we don't want to leave anybody out if you've got any questions. So um, let me tell you about our reproductive justice team, which is absolutely fabulous. We have some of our members um, that are on the call today. Um, we get together once a month by Zoom, um, like everybody else, because we're all over the world. And we um, we plan strategies. So um, right now we're waiting to see what the Republicans are up to. One of our members suggested that we join the opposition um, emails. Um, and so I get emails. I've joined three groups that are pro-life. And I can tell you it's pretty horrifying what they're asking for. Um, but it is interesting to see what their arguments are. In the past, we've had call storms to members of Congress, both to the Senate and to the House. Um, that was particularly true before the House voted for the Women's Health Protective Act, which they did vote on and it didn't get through the Senate. Um, we have sent postcards. We have um, sent, we've called, we've done email. We have a communications team that sends, our, sends out our news on all kinds of social media. And we also did a series of videos telling our stories and those uh, who wanted to, and they're on YouTube. And I bet if I ask nicely, um, Angela will type the YouTube channel in where you can see all, all of our videos talking about how we feel about it. And we did this to prompt um, people to get registered to vote in the midterms and in the presidential election, the last one, obviously. So let me introduce um, Carrie. Um, but before I do that, if you're interested in becoming part of our team, and if you're not already a member, um, I will type in or Angela will type in an email that you can reach us at. It's um, D -A -W I don't even know what it is, gwc-reproductivejustice at democratsabroad.org. Um, and that'll come to my inbox and we'll get you involved. 
Um, the GWC has lots of action teams. Today we're focusing on reproductive justice, but once you get involved, you won't be able to stop because it's such a huge and important subject. And let me tell you something, we have a lot of fun on our calls and I think certain of you that, that are on can speak to that. Anyway, we have a brilliant woman with us today um, who is sort of becoming a long distance friend because she's doing so much for us. Um, Carrie holds a JD and a PhD and is the, let me get this right, the Sylvia Douglas, no, Glue Glass, no. <laughs> Terry? Gosh, <laughs> but it's fine. Yes. Okay. Bauman Chair of American Studies and a professor in the program for the study of women and gender at Smith College at Amherst, Massachusetts. She is, as many of you know, a contributing editor for Miss Magazine, and she regularly writes on women's legal rights and feminist activism. Um, today, we've invited Carrie to talk to us about the state of the union, what's going on, um, because as you all know, Roe versus Wade has been uh, buried uh, and we're still all in mourning, but we also want to get some activism going. Um, and now that the Republicans have the House, so to speak, but we retain the Senate and the, of course, the presidency, um, we are all wondering what we can do to make this change um, and get it back on where we used to be before Roe was overturned. So Carrie, why don't you, take away the mic and let us know what you think we ought, ought to be doing and how bad it is out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sally, everybody. And it's great to be here. So uh, it's brutal. It's brutal. I had to stand up in front of my class of 55 students at Smith College, ranging in age from 18 to 22, and say for the first time ever, uh, you don't have the rights I had when I was your age in the 80s. To have to teach Dobbs was just uh, really, really hard this year, this semester. And to have to constantly follow what was going on. Now, there are good things happening as well as bad things, but to have to tell them repeatedly you know, this state's now banned abortion. And many of these students are from the states that are doing this. To have to be oh. involved at, at Smith to try on a reproductive health committee to try to figure out how is the college going to help our students who have to go back and during Thanksgiving break to states that ban abortion or, you know, during the summer. And so it's very real. The young women, at least at Smith, are pissed as hell which is good news, but it's, it's just for me, and I'm 57, I've been you know, active in the movement for decades. It's so appalling to think that we've gotten here and that this is what these young women are having to face. Uh, you know, uh, fewer rights than we had at their age. So, you know, sorry for that little emotive introduction, but it's just, it, it's, uh, it has mobilized us. I live in Massachusetts and there is a ton of work happening on the ground, which I'll tell you a little bit about today. Um, it is, you know, obviously over the last five, you know, six months since Dobbs, I, and even before, I have never written so many articles because I've been trying to follow it really closely and get the word out, sound the alarm and spread the great things that are happening so that we can do that in more states. What the Dobbs decision did is it threw it back to the states, uh, you know, and really, I think the movement relied too much on Roe. And, you know, when it looked pretty clear and starting in 2018 with the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court that we were going to lose Roe, a lot of advocates on the ground began working to pass laws creating affirmative rights to abortion. We had sort of not done that. There were still all these archaic laws on the books. In here in Massachusetts, we passed the Nasty Woman Act, which is an acronym for basically getting rid of archaic laws in 2018 after Kavanaugh got appointed to the court. And then in 2020, we passed the Roe Act, creating an affirmative right to abortion health care in the state, anticipating the fall of Roe. New York did the same thing in 2018 and other states. 
uh, Illinois and other states, blue states. And so we were prepared when Dobbs came down as far as, you know, having affirmative rights to abortion. Other states weren't. So look at what happened in Michigan. Michigan had a 1931 law that banned abortion. And so when Dobbs came down, I used the hashtag, hashtag zombie laws. These <laughs> zombie laws coming back to life where, you know, imposing these early 20th century or sometimes late 19th century uh, standards around abortion criminalizing doctors and and you know making all these requirements that you have to go to hospital committees you know and get multiple doctors to agree if you you, you were going to lose you know if your life was in, at risk in order to get an abortion so um what michigan had to do was uh collect advocates collected 750,000 signatures to get a ballot ref referendum on the November ballot. They did it successfully. It was on the ballot and, um, and they got it passed in the November election. There were six ballot measures on the, um, you know, uh, 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 in November, three of them were to affirm abortion rights and three were to restrict abortion rights. All six of them went in the direction of abortion rights. Michigan put it in their constitution as a right. Vermont did and California did. So that, those were great. And, and the majorities were overwhelming. But even in the ruby red states, um, they, they pushed back. They turned back measures to try to restrict abortion in Kentucky. And, um, and I'm off the top of my head, help me. It was uh, Missouri. No, not Missouri. Minnesota, and there was a third state that turned back restrictive abortion laws. So, so the ba Kansas. ballot measure, Kansas, it was Kansas. Yeah. Oh, Kansas. Kansas, Kentucky, and and um, in Montana, I think is what it Montana. was. Montana, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and they so those were all measures that were trying to restrict abortion, and and you know in Kansas it was fifty nine percent went pro choice in ruby red Kansas. So um, you know that was good news. And, you know, everybody predicted in the elections that, you know, it would be this red wave. Uh, I knew it wasn't going to be. Ms. Magazine had done polling, and especially among young women, young women, their number one issue was bodily autonomy and reproductive rights. And it was above inflation. It was above all these issues that all the mainstream press said were the most important mm -hmm. driving things of the election. Young women turned out, again, in unprecedented numbers. Ms. Uh, Feminist Majority, uh, which is um, owns Ms. Magazine, organized in nine states, which were battleground states. And the way they organized is they went to college campuses. They hired organizers to register for people to vote and to get them out voting. And those were the squeaker states that made the difference, like Pennsylvania and, um, you know, other states that enabled us to keep control of the Senate, which was absolutely critical. Now, of course, we lost the House, but we lost it with a lot less than what we thought we would. Um, yeah. But that's really going to tie our hands as far as uh, any federal legislation. Our hands were already tied because of the filibuster and the recalcitrance and trying to get rid of the filibuster. But the fact that we have, um, you know, we've picked up a seat in the Senate is absolutely critical for particularly court appointments, but other, um, you know, sort of executive branch appointments that are really important and that Republicans have been blocking. So, so that was all good news and, and, um, and, you know, shows that there's a lot of pushback now that Dobbs has, has, um, come down and Roe has been overturned. Um, states also in the few weeks that were, were left in the legislative session post Dobbs, but you know, before the end of the session, passed amazing laws that create shields for providers that are serving people from states with bans. So Connecticut passed a law. What these shield, C Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, California, and I believe Illinois, um, at least those and maybe some others, passed laws that created these protective shields for clinicians, um, doctors, nurses who are providing reproductive health care to people. Um, these shield laws basically say that the state 
apparatus is not going to be complicit in any way with any sort of criminal or civil prosecution of healthcare providers that are providing care to people that are accessing abortion health care that's legal in the state but maybe right. not legal in the state that they're coming from. So if somebody travels from Texas to Massachusetts, gets care from a doctor, and then Texas decides to try to prosecute that doctor, you know, issue subpoenas, issue warrants, extradition orders, they will not, the Massachusetts courts will not honor those orders. Same thing with civil laws. If under the Texas bounty hunter law, somebody wins a, a suit against a doctor in Massachusetts for providing care to a Texas citizen, and they come to Massachusetts and try to enforce that order um, against the doctor, the Massachusetts courts will not enforce it. And in fact, the provider law gives a countersuit a civil countersuit to doctors for the exact amount of the Texas, uh, any sort of Texas order um, that so that they will not be liable. Um, the law also protects their medical licenses, their insurance. So, you know, insurance companies can't up the rates because people are providing care to people from states with bans and uh, you know, and, and more. Let's see, it's their medical licenses, their insurance care, you know, any sort of subpoenas they don't have to respond to, uh, courts won't enforce them, uh, any sort of warrants or anything. So, you know, that's great. I um, mean, you know, of course, it only protects people in those states, but it's an important thing because many of these red states are threatening all kinds of, uh, you know, things that that could potentially make doctors in blue states offering care uh, concerned uh, about their their safety, their, you know, their medical practice or their freedom, quite frankly. So, um, but out of all those states that passed provider laws, one state expanded it to telemedicine abortion, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And this is really groundbreaking because what that does is it enables providers in Massachusetts to provide telemedicine abortion care, in other words, abortion care with pills, to somebody in Texas, even when they're located in Texas, and mail the pills directly to those Texas people and still be protected by the provider law. Now, Massachusetts was the only state to do that, but just earlier this month, legislators in New York introduced a similar law. And I wrote a piece for Ms. just, it went up yesterday about this, and it's going to um, potentially be voted on soon. So if you know people in New York, I strongly um, urge you to contact your friends in New York and tell them to contact their representatives. Um, and I can drop my story in the box. And the story yeah. has, uh, I'll do that right now. It has, um, here it is, it, it has a link at the bottom for who, you know, with the, the petition and, and all that. And so you can find that. It's through NYCLU, New York Civil Liberties Union. So definitely contact your friends in New York about that. And, you know, obviously a doctor or a nurse, a clinician who is going to provide this telemedicine care to people in states with bans is going to be taking a risk. But the fact of the matter is abortion doctors have always taken risks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it means they won't be able to travel to Texas or any states, you know, because they're potentially open to to prosecution. But it there are very brave providers out there who are willing to do this. And and by the way, Massachusetts passed this law in July. Um, folks in the movement have been working to try to have to set up. How do you set up a business like this that's as insulated as possible? And, and it's taken a little while, but the word has it that the first provider in Massachusetts to offer this kind of care is going to go online soon, like in the coming weeks. I'm trying to get a hold of that person to interview them, um, but they're they don't they don't really want their name out there. So I'm I'm trying to get an anonymous interview. I really want to know kind of what obstacles are they facing. I know that there's a provider in New York who's preparing to do this and has a, had a really hard time getting an insurance company to cover them. Mm -hmm. to cover them for this practice. And so anyway, it's it's a work in progress, but there's a wonderful move, movement behind it. A lot of heads in the room figuring out how to do this. 
And, you know, obviously telemedicine abortion care is limited in the sense that it can only be used through about 11 weeks. Um, you know, it's very safe. Abortion pills are safer than Tylenol. But if somebody does need to go to medical care, if they're located in a banned state, you know, they could be harassed um, for you know, there's no way to test if somebody used abortion pills. The it's the treatment's the same as if it's a miscarriage, and there's there's no way they can tell unless the person says they took a pills. But um, and by the way, there's only two states criminalize self-managed abortion at this mm -hmm. moment: Nevada and South Carolina. However, there are states threatening to criminalize it. Most criminal abortion bans prohibit doctors from providing the service. They don't prohibit people from getting the care. That's really important to keep in mind. But that said, even without specific criminal bans of people taking abortion pills or self-managing abortion, prosecutors find creative ways to go after them. We know that because they've been doing it for years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, People that self-manage abortion, and I'll talk more um, about the movement to self-manage abortion because there's a vibrant, extensive movement on the ground in the United States right now. And I've been covering this very closely for Ms. and myself been involved in this movement, so I can speak to it. But the, the point being that... Um, you know, there is concern about if people are using abortion pills, however they get them, whether they get them through a U.S. provider, through telemedicine or other ways that, you know, there is potential legal exposure. Um, so I'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. But but now I just want to quickly and I know you all know this, but I want to quickly share my screen and just show you where we are right now as far as abortion access in the United States and what the laws are. So I'm sharing the New York Times um page and i know yeah. it's the new york times can everybody see it okay great so so this is a map um the new york times updates this whenever there's a development so i just find it pretty handy and easy to look at um and so this is a map of the united states and the dark red states are states that ban abortion at fertilization so in other words before pregnancy you know, you're only pregnant once a fertilized egg embeds in the uterine wall. Well, these are not banning it at that point. They're banning it before that, the point at which an egg and a sperm come together to create an embryo or a, at the beginning, a zygote, right? And it doesn't become a pregnancy until, you know, a week or two later when, when the fertilized egg finally implants in the uterine wall. So they're banning it at fertilization with very, very narrow exceptions. Many of these states do not have exceptions for rape or incest. Uh, they don't even have exceptions for health. Like if, you know, going through with this pregnancy is going to make you blind, they're like, we don't care. You got to go through with it, right? The only exception is a very narrow life exception, if it will endanger your life. And, and what we've seen on the ground is that this is really endangering people's life because doctors have to wait until somebody's dying, quite frankly. And there's so many stories and you probably are seeing them, but we see them a ton in the media here in the States. Stories about women that have almost died because they couldn't get the care they need. Maybe they're in the middle of a miscarriage and they're bleeding or they have an infection, but the doctors feel like, well, let's just wait and see. There's still a fetal heartbeat. We're afraid if we if we give you mifepristone or misoprostol or if or a procedural abortion, we're afraid that if we do that, we'll be criminally prosecuted. We'll lose our license. We could lose our freedom. And you know, doctors invest a lot in their careers and in their practices, and they're very conservative people. Even abortion doctors, they're terrified. They're terrified, and they work. You know, and so they've been put in this this. Um, you know, sort of Sophie's choice of, um, you know, their 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 own practice and well-being and freedom versus, you know, the lives of their patients. I mean, it's it's just 
terrifying. So, so four, uh, I think it's 14, 13, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 states have fully banned it. Georgia's banned it at six weeks. And then if you scroll down on this page, and I'll drop the URL in the um, in the box, but you can see there are other states um, that have banned it slightly later, like 15 weeks in Florida, um, 18 or 20 weeks, Utah, Arizona, North Carolina. Um, but then on top of that, um, there are many bans that have been you know, temporarily blocked by the courts. Um, so it's a mixed bag in places like Iowa, Indiana, Ohio, and, and these things are constantly changing. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I think this is, I mean, it's updated as of January 6th. Now that legislative sessions are back in, uh, there's all these bills being introduced. And, um, you know, you have your uh, researcher, Angela, or whoever, that was one of you that said you're researching this and that's wonderful because it's really a moving target and hard to see. This is the sort of encouraging map, the map of where it's legal, um, which is the darker green and legal but limited, which is the lighter green. Um, and so, you know, states, as I mentioned, like Massachusetts, New York, Michigan, now with the new measure, Illinois, California. I mean, these are states that have passed either by statute or in some cases by, by constitutional amendment, a, you know, affirmative right to abortion health care. And um, the limited ones, are ones that have a statutory right, but they may have limitations or exceptions or restrictions that make it hard to get. So um, I'm gonna drop this link. I'm gonna stop sharing and drop this link in the chat so that you have this. Um, if you wanna, I just, I book note it and regularly right. look at it to try to keep up with what's happening. By the way, if anybody wants to ask uh, oh, I see some questions coming in. I'm going to try to look at these as they come in and answer them before I kind of move on to the next thing. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, somebody just asked, is reversing medical abortions a thing? It is not a real thing. It's a fictional thing that the anti-abortion movement is leaning into hard. So um, I am very active on this issue and um, particularly, I'm very active on the widespread phenomenon of these crisis pregnancy centers or these anti-abortion fake clinics, these mm -hmm. organizations that pretend to be medical providers or to offer unbiased health information about pregnancy and abortion that are, in fact, often evangelical anti-abortion organizations that are part of national and international networks that are heavily funded and, you know, behind a lot of these anti-abortion bans and the stacking of the Supreme Court. The sort of, until now, largely invisible front of the anti-abortion movement are, are these crisis pregnancy centers. Um, they're heavily funded, sometimes getting state funding uh, directly or through or, uh, things like TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, which is federal uh, welfare money. They have managed to redirect in conservative states, a lot in about 11 states, that money to coerce pregnant women, often low income women, to have more children that they can't afford. And the irony is that they're taking money to support low income women with children, to coerce those same women to have more children they can't afford. And they're doing it without giving them any, any real support. So, um, so one of the primary strategies of crisis pregnancy centers is this um, false uh, argument about abortion pill reversal, that if women get, a, or people who are pregnant get a high dose of progesterone after taking mifepristone, which is the first pill that you take, that it can counter uh, the development, you know, the, the abortion. Um, there has no research to support that. The research that was done on this was abandoned because the research subjects had dangerous hemorrhaging and they yeah. couldn't ethically continue the research. And so this is a, a unproven and dangerous thing that 
these anti-abortion crisis pregnancy centers are widely promoting. If you Google it, you'll see it's all over the place. And so uh, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but there is a lot of activism about what are we going to do about this? How can we protect people? But I'm going to get back to that in a second. There's another question. Can you explain what Born Alive Infants Protection Laws are all about? So one of those um, uh, uh, referendums that I mentioned, the anti-abortion referendums related to this. I think it was the Montana one. Um, this is another myth that the anti-abortion movement perpetuates, uh, that, that abortions result in live babies that then get, I guess, killed or something or not helped that doesn't happen but this is a way it's kind of like you know remember back way back in the day the um the uh laws they used to pass um oh now i'm forgetting they, they always come up with this sort of inflammatory language that is just inaccurate and so that's part of that you know uh this is not a thing but they pretend it's a thing and then they pass laws about it and really it's about um stigmatizing abortion health care and you know, creating myths about what happens when abortion happens. So um, that's that's kind of all I will say. At the, yeah, partial birth abortions. Thank you. That's what they used to ban partial birth abortions, which again is not a thing. But they would just make make shit up to you know, and then say this is what the you know abortion industry is doing, um, and then ban it. And so there's it's, a it's, um, yeah, there's a bill in West Virginia that that does just right. that. It talks about a born alive um, infant right. protection. Right. That, that you, right. You know, if you can hear a heartbeat, you're done. <laughs> it's right. not a stillbirth. Right, uh, right. So they, um, you know, and again, it's just a way to stigmatize abortion. So, um, so we have Dobbs. I've talked a little bit about bans. I've talked about the ballot measures. I've talked about the protective laws. Um, in addition, uh, there are other kinds of laws that sort of pro-choice states are trying to pass and have passed. There is a lot of push for funding um, abortion funds. So abortion mm -hmm. funds, there's over 100 abortion funds throughout the United States. And these funds were established back in the 70s and 80s and on. It's because of the Hyde Amendment, which prohibited Medicaid money from going to people seeking abortion health care. So mm -hmm. abortion funds were created to raise money privately and to support people who couldn't afford abortion health care. So they often have hotlines or they work directly with clinics to fund these abortions. And they've been operating, as I said, for, for decades. And now there's a real push for public funding of abortion funds to or and directly to clinics. And so like here in Massachusetts, in the legislation that we passed in July, we, uh, I think the state gave a million dollars to abortion funds, or, or maybe it was later, it was, it, was, it was in December, I think. And that is being divided between the four funds in the state. And so uh, um, that is, and that's to help people not only pay for the care, but pay for travel to receive the care. Mm -hmm. So many people, and, and actually I'm gonna just, it, it, I want to just diverge off a little bit, like what's happening on the ground? How are people getting care? So the the right after Roe, in the months after Roe was overturned, there was research showing that the number of abortions in the United States decreased about 10%, which was less than you would think. And partly that's because people were traveling to states where abortion was legal. And also... Um, getting abortion pills in, you know, through telemedicine or other ways. There's a uh, Austria-based telemedicine abortion organization called Aid Access, run by Dr. Rebecca Gompertz, that mails abortion pills to people in all 50 states. Post-Dobbs, the number of requests for abortion pills to her organization skyrocketed and actually outnumbered the 10% drop in abortion within the United States. And so I wrote a piece a while back saying that people are finding abortion, they're just doing it in other ways. You know, they're, they're not doing it on the record officially. So they're ordering pills through the mail or through organizations like Aid Access, or they're traveling to blue states and getting that care. Now, I don't know, I haven't 
that I wrote that piece a few months ago, and I don't know like what the current numbers are, but there is a very vibrant um, underground movement to try to get abortion pills to people that need it. And uh, so let me talk a little bit about telemedicine abortion and changes. I already talked about how Massachusetts has protected telemedicine abortion providers who are providing care to people in states with bans, you know, and mailing them pills. Let me talk a little bit about what's been happening. So in December 2021, the FDA finally removed a restriction on abortion pills that required that doctors give the pills to patients in person. This had been, um, this requirement had been temporarily lifted during COVID because of concern about exposure to COVID. The FDA had, under Biden, had temporarily res um, rescinded that requirement of in-person distribution. And before that, it had been done in a court of law because the Trump administration had refused to lift it. And so all these telemedicine abortion providers sprung up. I call them sort of virtual abortion clinics. And they're now operating in about 24 states across the United States. Here in Massachusetts, we have about 10 of them. Organizations like, um, you know, they have the Lilith, Lilith Care and um, Abortion on Demand, uh, Just the Pill, Pills by Post, Choice. There's, they have all these wonderful creative names. And they're operating across the United States. And they basically people can request the care on their on their websites, on their platforms. Some of them do the entire consultation just by, you know, text or email, you know, protected, encrypted email. Some of them require video conferencing. Some of them do it by telephone call. So you contact them, you tell them your situation, and then usually within a day or two, they will mail you pills. And you can get them overnight or you can get them regular delivery, three to five days. They often charge a lot less than brick and mortar clinics, um, anywhere from like $150 to $300. So it makes it much more affordable. And this is really exploding in the blue states because it's widely available. The word is getting out about abortion pills generally, but telemedicine abortion in particularly, in particular. But um, so um, I see the note about there's no protected encrypted email. So it's happening on platforms. So in other words, you're not email. I said email, but what I mean is that you go onto like a messaging platform that's encrypted and protected. That's like, like you do with your regular doctor. You know how you correspond with your doctor? Mm -hmm. You know, they have these platforms. That's what um, that's what's happening. The way that these um, virtual abortion providers are providing to people. So the FDA, um, again, permanently allowed telemedicine abortion in December of 2021. However, about 19 states ban telemed. Well, 19 states have state level laws requiring providers to hand the pills to people in person. Now, there's an argument that those state laws are preempted by the FDA decision, but it's not. And I've written on that, but it's not a clear legal case, and and it hasn't at this point been pursued in court in part because of Dobbs and the abortion ban. So it's like a much bigger problem. It's not just that they're banning handing pills in person, they're banning abortion altogether. So there's been a bit of a shift. Um, however, the um, there's been two recent changes by the FDA that have been, um, well, one recent change by the FDA and one recent opinion issued by the Department of Justice around abortion pills that have been very helpful for abortion access. The first is that the FDA um, created a process whereby abortion pills can be distributed by brick and mortar pharmacies. So as part of the you know 20 year restriction on abortion, they never let pharmacies distribute the pills. They always required that doctors themselves had to distribute the pills, hand them to patients in person. And uh, they didn't allow brick and mortar pharmacies to do it. But what the FDA has now changed its position, they're allowing you know, CVS and Walgreens and all these pharmacies to do it. They do require that the pharmacies have to become certified to do it, which again, is just an obstacle. But 
Walgreens and CVS have both said they're going to pursue this certification and make this available. The advantage of this is that people don't have to wait for pills to be mailed to them. Um, you know, again, they can get the pills overnight, but sometimes they don't have an address where it can be mailed to that they're comfortable receiving the, like if they have an abusive partner or if they're a 17 year old and they don't want their parents to see it, they would rather just go and pick it up at a pharmacy. You know, other people prefer to get it in the mail because it's more private. They don't have to like go to a pharmacist who will know their business, they'd rather receive it in the mail. But so this could really, it would normalize abortion pills and into the regular system, and it will in greatly in increase access. So in other words, you live in a small town in, you know, a state, a big state like Montana, rather than waiting for pills to be delivered, you can go to your local CVS and get them. Uh, if you know, if it happens now, you know, uh, the aunties are threatening to protest at pharmacies, but I think that's going to, it's easier to protest abortion clinics because then you're like, you know, harassing a, a smaller group of people, but like everybody goes to CVS to get their pills. And so I think it's going to be harder to do that. I think people are going to, if, you know, if you're going to get your, you know, insulin and they're harassing you for getting an abortion, you're like, I'm getting my insulin. I mean, it's going to be harder to sort of target people, but that is certainly something that's going to be a, a, a forthcoming battle. So, um, but a footnote to that. Oh, so then the other thing is the Department of Justice issued an opinion recently saying that, um, the USPS can send abortion pills into states that ban abortion. Mm -hmm. The anti-abortion movement has filed a lawsuit in Texas saying that the Comstock laws, if you remember back in the day, Anthony Comstock, who was like one of these like pants on fire anti-vice crusaders that didn't want anybody to talk about sex and that Margaret Sanger, you know, like went head to head with. So the Comstock laws ban mailing anything that's obscene through the mails, including abortificents or birth control information or whatever. Now, a lot of the Comstock laws were invalidated by things like um, Griswold versus Connecticut, the birth control decision, or Roe versus Wade, which, you know, legalized abortion, or other cases along the way. This is hashtag zombie laws. With Roe being overturned, what the anti-abortion movement is doing is trying to revise the, revive the Comstock law. And what they're arguing in this Texas lawsuit, strategically filed in a very conservative district and assigned to a total right-wing judge who, you know, is just a nightmare as far as abortion rights and other things, contraceptive rights. They're arguing that the FDA legalization of the abortion pill and allowing it to be mailed violates the Comstock law. That is the argument in this case. I wrote a piece about it uh, a month or two ago, and so you can find that on my, my list of um, articles. And the maker of the abortion pill is now intervening in this case, Danko, and uh, it's, you know, it could potentially be the route that they try to ban the abortion pill. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous argument. They're also in that lawsuit, by the way, saying that in 2000, when the FDA approved the abortion pill, that they did it wrong. Therefore, the approval should be overturned. Again, That's crazy. Ridiculous, <laughs> crazy argument, especially considering there is so much medical science to show that this pill is safer than Tylenol. It's just super, super safe. Uh, yeah, it is. It's safer than Tylenol. It really should be on the pharmacy shelf next to Tylenol. And it's still heavily restricted by the FDA and all these other restrictions. So, you know, while I love that the FDA did this recent ruling, if you read my piece on this, I kind of like call them out for yeah. continuing these restrictions. I mean, yes, it's great that they're allowing pharmacies, but it's totally not necessary that they require that pharmacies, um, here, I'll pop my, that piece in, that they're requiring pharmacies to get certified. They're just creating obstacles. It should be available over the counter. And, you know, there are advocates working on trying to make that happen. Here's my piece on the, the recent decision to allow the pills available in pharmacies. Great, but still unnecessary and burdensome. Um, and by the way, this um, this six-page memo that the 
um, you know, Thank you for that. <laughs> just released the White House saying, oh, we're doing so good. The Biden Harris administration is doing so great. And, you know, they've got a lot on their plate. I understand. But here they're trying to brag about all the things they do. And I mean, they have done a lot of things. But, you know, one thing is they brag about that FDA decision to allow the pills available in pharmacies. And it's like, OK, but why do you still restrict the pills at all? The medical science is absolutely overwhelming that it should be available like any other drug with no restrictions at all. Doctors are still required to be certified, which, again, makes it hard. You know, any your GP should be able to prescribe it like they prescribe anything to you. But if this is requiring they get certified, which, again, just they're not going to do. They're too busy. They're, you know, it's hard. Although do act, ask your doctors to get certified if you're in the U.S. because they should be so that they, if they have a patient that needs this care, they should be able to get it as soon as possible and not have to go off to an, an abortion doctor to get it. Um, so, okay. I am going to um, just, okay. So there's no extra questions. Somebody said, uh, Indiana just filed a bill to keep not only government money from paying for abortions, but also political entities from paying for people to have abortions. So, so yeah, thank you. Everybody can see these comments. So, yeah. um, so I won't repeat them, but um, where are we on time? Oh my gosh, we're already so far along. Let That's okay, just... Terry, keep going. keep going. Okay, okay. Actually, I'm going to say just a couple things um, uh, at this point. Emergency contraception. So. Right. In um, in Thomas's dissent, excuse me, concurrence in Dobbs, he says he thinks that Griswold should be reconsidered. Griswold mm -hmm. is the Supreme Court case that protects emergency, well, uh, contraception Not generally. Really. And several lawmakers around the court country have been threatening to introduce legislation to restrict contraception particularly emergency contraception, which the anti-abortion movement has been working for years to try to argue is a form of abortion, which it is not. It does not work if you're pregnant. And um, recently, the FDA, and I, I'll pop my article on this, and this is, again, was just a couple days ago that I published this article. The FDA, um, oh, actually, let me first drop my article about the Department of Justice uh, memo on mailing abortion pills. Um, oh wait, everyone, let me just. Yeah, drop while that Carrie's in. while Carrie's doing that, um, I circulated this article, this circular, whatever you want to call it, to all on my team and to all of the leadership in the Global Women's Caucus. Okay, great, great. If anybody wants it, as Carrie just said. Um, send me an email, um, but it's readily available online and it, it doesn't say okay. much. Thank you. Okay. So this, um, this article I just put in there, it's about the FDA recently changed the label for emergency contraception. When it was originally approved, you know, over a decade ago, there were some anti-abortion members of the FDA advisory committee who insisted that the label on emergency contraceptives say that it could potentially interfere with implantation of a fertilized egg. There was no evidence that that was the case, but as a compromise, the FDA included that on the label. This has been used by the anti-abortion movement to say that emergency contraception, you know, a morning after pill, can cause abortion. Now, it doesn't because a pregnancy is not established until the egg, the fertilized egg implants in the uterine wall. And that doesn't, you know, so if the medications preventing that implanting, there's no pregnancy, so there's no abortion. But because they define abortion as interfering with a fertilized egg from implanting, they, you know, they say that it is a form of abortion. So what this label change says is that Emergency contraception has no impact on a fertilized egg implanting in the uterine wall. The way that it functions is it prevents an egg from exiting, you know, coming down the, fallo the um, fallopian tube, or it prevents a sperm and an egg from coming together and fertilizing. So it's very clear that emergency contraception is not a form of abortion or 
it will not interfere with the implantation of a fertilized egg. So this is really important because that label was cited in cases like the Hobby Lobby case where the Hobby Lobby, you know, argued they didn't want to cover emergency contraception under the contraceptive mandate of the Affordable Care Act because they thought it was a form of abortion. And it was actually even cited in the Supreme Court case as here, you know, they believe this and yeah, it might be true. Here's the FDA label, you know, and it, there was never any science for that. Matter of fact, there's a ton of science showing that's not how it works and that it's not going to interfere with a fertilized egg and planting. So this was a really important step because it, it you know, I mean, they're going to keep on saying what they say because science doesn't matter to them, but it really, it, it means that they can't point to the FDA label and say, look, look. So um, that was huge. Um, the other thing I want to briefly talk about is kind of like how are people trying to combat crisis pregnancy centers and the misinformation that crisis pregnancy centers are perpetuating. So I'll just talk a little bit about here in Massachusetts. Our amazing attorney general, who is now our new governor, Maura Healy, who is, by the way, the first uh, out lesbian government governor in the country. We're very excited about her. She's just amazing. Our first elected female governor as well. Um, so she issued, a, uh, when she was attorney general, a consumer alert about crisis pregnancy centers and about how they um, perpetuate misinformation and do things like abortion pill reversal, which is dangerous. And so she created a complaint process where people can complain about crisis pregnancy centers if they have negative experiences, and then the attorney general's office will investigate them. Other states are beginning to do this as well. So that's one strategy that's being used. Another strategy is passing deceptive advertising mm. laws. So if you take your phone and Google um, abortion services near me, here in Western Massachusetts, the first thing that comes up is Clearway Clinic. Sounds like maybe it's a women's health clinic. No, it's an anti-abortion crisis pregnancy center that's going to talk to you about how you're, you know, just give you a bunch of misinformation, how, you know, abortion causes cancer, which it doesn't. And abortion, you know, will make you depressed, which it doesn't. And so um, we're trying to pass local ordinances to um, hold these centers liable if they deceptively advertise that they provide abortion when they don't. Uh, there are other strategies that are happening, um, funding public education campaigns about crisis pregnancy mm -hmm. centers. Our past governor, um, Governor Charlie Baker, vetoed this provision in our recent law, but I know that our current governor will sign it to fund a public education campaign about how these, we have 29 of them in, the, in Massachusetts, many more CPCs than abortion clinics. There are over 2,700 across the United States. And some, wow. you know, and now in states that have gotten rid of abortion clinics, they're the only thing there is. So people can get ultrasounds or whatever are these crisis pregnancy centers. And they, they have ultrasound machines. Often they don't have people that are actually qualified ultrasound technicians. Um, and, you know, another approach is trying to go after them for practicing medicine without a license. Or um, there's a story coming out of Kentucky that one of these crisis pregnancy centers was doing transvaginal ultrasounds with dirty equipment. They were uh. not sterilizing the equipment between patients or between clients and infecting women with dirty equipment. I mean, because they're not licensed, they're often not, you know, they just buy these machines and then put on white lab coats and pretend that they're medical providers. There's a great reveal um, news story that I'll share with you, Sally, recently about the practices of these organizations. So anyway, those are just some of the examples. Um, there's a great group, hashtag Expose Fake Clinics. It's mm -hmm. run by um, Liz Winstead's Abortion Access Front, which is they're doing protests and out in front of CPCs to try to raise awareness. They're doing all sorts of campaigns to try to uh, let people know. I wrote a very powerful story of a college student outside of Boston who 
who went to one of these CPCs and had a very traumatizing experience. They gave her inaccurate medical information. They collected her personal information. That's another thing is that they're collecting personal information and medical information, and they're not covered by HIPAA often because they don't file insurance claims. And so they're feeding this information to these national and international groups, and it's being used by the anti-abortion movement. And so just this young woman that I interviewed about six months ago recently texted me and she, she said, oh my God, I got another text from them. They're asking me if I gave birth or not because it was her due date. You know, actually the inaccurate due date because they dated her pregnancy inaccurately, but they texted her and she had given them her mother's information because, you know, they asked for an emergency contact and she was terrified they were going to contact her mother because she did not feel comfortable talking with her mother about this. And so it's just, it's a total nightmare. Um, so there's a very vibrant growing movement to try to counter these crisis pregnancy centers. And by the way, they're all over the world. The US is exporting this crisis. Yes, they're they in your country. They're in your country. There's a great UK-based organization that's looking at CPCs. Um, it's called Privacy International. They're focusing on it from the privacy aspect, but they did a lot of research about how, and there's also a great researcher based in Kentucky um, who did research on how the US is exporting CPCs around the world to like Israel and Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, her name is, I'm blanking on her name, but I can share that with you, Sally, if folks are interested. So the very last thing I'm going to say, because we're almost at noon, is the Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment. I am a big advocate for the argument that equal rights amendments are really important to strengthen abortion rights. It has not historically been seen as an equality issue because um, when the Supreme Court handed down Roe, they had, they, they, their reasoning was privacy. That's kind of, um, you know, it was an amazing decision, obviously, but it's kind of a weak argument because that is that opened the door to the Hyde Amendment. It's like, if it's privacy, then the government doesn't have to fund it. They just don't have to like interfere. Well, of course, not funding it for women on Medicaid is interfering, but the Supreme Court in a series of decisions said, no, no, it's not. And so equality arguments basically say that if you you know, if women don't have access to uh, abortion and reproductive health care, they can't be equal. They can't participate equally in the, um, you know, in society and, you know, live their lives equally. And so now post Dobbs, a number of advocates across the country are increasingly using equality arguments to try to expand abortion rights. An example is in the state of Pennsylvania. They are challenging a funding ban for abortion under their state equal rights amendment. That is an ongoing case. I've written on it. You can find it on my list of, um, of articles. And um, other states are, you know, sort of dusting off their equal rights amendments and seeing, it, could this be used as a tool? Could we file a case challenging an abortion statute ban under the state equal rights amendment? Um, there was a Michigan case before the referendum where an amazing feminist district court judge issued this, this ruling saying, absolutely, if you ban abortion, it violates equality protections. Um, you know, that case is now moot because they've passed their constitutional amendment, but I wrote a piece about that a while ago. It was wonderful. The other thing is there's an equal rights amendment on the, um, before this, the legislature in New York right now, New York does not have an equal rights amendment at all. And they, but they've drafted this amazing equal rights amendment that not only prohibits discrimination based on sex, but also prohibits discrimination based on pregnancy and pregnancy outcome and reproductive health and autonomy. And to my knowledge, this is the first ERA that in explicitly includes protections for pregnancy and reproductive health access. I just popped in the, um, in the chat, my story that just went live yesterday on this. They voted this constitutional amendment through last year. The process in New York is you have to vote it through the legislature twice, and then it goes on the ballot. So if they pass this in the coming weeks, and they're hoping to pass it next week, then it will be on the 2024 ballot and potentially become the 28th state to have an equal rights amendment. So we're all very excited. Nevada, by the way, passed an equal rights amendment in last November, and it was a 
broad equal rights amendment was the first one to also protect against um, gender identity and expression discrimination, as well as age, as well um, as some other things. So um, anyway, um, somebody said Montana filed a bill saying that the protection of privacy in their constitution will not include abortion. So yeah, I mean, that's working both ways. People are looking to state constitutions like privacy provisions and arguing, some are arguing, oh, this pr protects abortion and others are arguing, oh no, it doesn't, you know, and they're trying to pass legislation. Uh, New Mexico has more facilities for out-of-state abortions than they have patients. The obstacle is getting out the word. How do we reach women in poor rural areas or those who are not aware of the work being done? So thank you for that question. I'll, I'll just sort of shift over um, to questions now because I think I sort of hit all my highlights. But so absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, go ahead, Carrie. I'll, I'll ask you a few questions after we're done with the chat room. Go ahead. Okay, so how do we get the word out? So there are over a hundred um, abortion funds, and in states that have banned abortion, those abortion funds have to be very careful. They are many of them no longer funding abortions because, especially in states like Texas, that could be aiding and abetting, right? Mm -hmm. Remember those bounty hunter laws, SBA, and a couple other states have passed them, and so um, they have to be careful. That said, we all still have First Amendment rights. And this, this comes to the issue of abortion pills as well. You can talk about what people are doing. You know, it's one thing to say you should travel out of state and go to New Mexico and get an abortion. That potentially, you know, could be aiding and abetting. But if you just say people are traveling out of state for abortion, to places like XYZ, or New Mexico has a bunch of new clinics along the border. I mean, that is a fact, and that is your free speech right to say that. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of efforts, you know, and funds are often involved in this, although they, again, if they're in the states with bans, they have to be careful, but um, there are efforts to try to get the word out through community networks, through social media, through, you know, uh, you know, TikTok, Instagram, a lot of young people are in Instagram and TikTok to try to get information out about um, how to get to states where abortion care is legal, how to get abortion pills if you're in a state where it's not, you don't have access and you can't travel out of state, um, how to use mail forwarding to get pills, how to, you know, many of these virtual abortion care providers are not asking where people live. So people are having it mailed to a friend in another state who's then mailing it to them, or they're having it, you know, they're using mail forwarding, they're renting a post office box and having it mailed to, you know, a state where that provider is licensed and then forwarded to them in Texas or one of the other banned states. So, you know, it's a process. There is definitely a vibrant underground self-managed abortion movement and a vibrant movement trying to get people information. There's a great group called the Bridget Alliance, which raises money to provide resources for people to travel to get abortion care. Um, you know, many abortion funds are taking this on now too, but the Bridget Alliance was established to do that and they have expertise in that. So if you're interested in supporting that, I encourage you to check them out. Uh, they, um, they, I think they're based in New York City. Uh, so they're kind of protected. And again, many of these abortion laws uh, that are on the books right now criminalize medical providers. Uh, now, I have no doubt that states are going to be passing more and more laws to criminalize other kind of people that are providing support for traveling out of state. And, you know, there's threats to even criminalize people who are sharing information. But the First Amendment still exists. And you know, as long as, and I, I say it this way because I talk on this all the time and in places, you know, that do have bans, I'm very careful to talk about it as I'm sharing information. I'm not telling anybody to do anything against the law. I'm not directing anybody to do anything. And so it's a slight linguistic shift, but I think it's important, um, particularly for somebody like me that's so out there public or people, organizations that are doing this work on the ground. Um, you know, which is not to say they're not, somebody might not go after them for conspiring to help somebody, you know, but we have very strong 
First Amendment rights here in the United States, stronger than like, you know, free speech rights in many of the countries where you come from, like France, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, but at the end of the day, it ends up before the current Supreme Court. And so I, you know, again, that decision was, as for me as a lawyer, was really demoralizing. And, and so I, you know, it's sort of a shifting ground. But by the same token, you know, I don't think we should obey unjust laws. And these abortion bans are unjust. And, you know, we all have to make our decisions about what kind of risks we take. So I I'm going to stop. Uh, no, no, no. I get a glass of water. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. um, I, let let me um, thank you first for all of that incredible information. I mean, it, you you are just wonderful, Carrie. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And I'm thank sure you. this is not the last time we will be able to speak with you, I hope. Um, sure, so anytime. Again and again and again. Uh, just to bring it a little bit home, um, mm -hmm. because uh, the people listening in and as a general matter, um, Democrats abroad want to know what they can do. Yes. So, um, you know, our mission is to get people to register and to vote. That That is our bottom line. My group or the group that I help, um, we want to figure out what our strategy should be, not only as out of town voters, so to speak, yeah. through absentee ballots and the like, but what can we be doing now to move the movement forward. Now, um, one idea that, that I brought up with Anne the other day is we're gonna try to put together a group of representatives from Democratic Party state parties and the women that are fighting for them, but potentially in red states because we wanna try to get into the red states. Now we don't have boots on the ground, but lots of other organizations do. And we want to try to coordinate with them. I mean, this is a this is an ongoing conversation. What I'm talking about it's to figure yeah. out what, how we can help at a distance to um, help the bills to further them through in red states, um, current red states, and even to, for example, get rid of the Montana bill that says that privacy. I mean that that is a that bill whether it passes or not is exactly they're just trying to legislate Rover, um, Dobbs okay because yes. they took away the privacy argument um, and they took away the ninth and the fourteenth amendment so the idea is to get a dialogue going um, but as of today where do you see the cutting edge work being done other, in addition to what you've just shared with us on crisis pregnancy centers and what can people that are not there actually do to help um what what should we be doing to facilitate inf outflow of information for yeah. example as Jacqueline Swartz asked um what kinds of ideas because you know it's very frustrating being abroad in a sense because yeah. although we benefit from a lot of um of the good laws that support women yes um, and allow abortions and have child care centers and do every you know um we suffer from the distance because we can't we feel like we can't help so my question to you is what do you see long distance runners doing outside of the United States to to aid in a bit the good side. Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, one thing that, you know, yes, the physical distance is one thing, but, you know, in the virtual world, there's a lot right. you can do um, to spread information about abortion pills, to spread information about how people are accessing the care they need despite these bans. Mm -hmm. So one organization I promote a lot is PlanCPills.org. Plan C is the name of the organization. They have an amazing yeah. website, which gives information. I'll put it in the plancypills.org. That gives information for people in all 50 states about where they can get abortion pills safely and legally, or in states where it's banned, how they can get them anyway. Okay. And Plan C, they have this ambassador program, which people can sign up to be Plan C ambassadors, which is about uh, working on social media largely to reach different communities with this information and educate them about abortion pills. It's interesting, over the last two years, uh, when I first started really seriously covering abortion pills, 
research showed that only about 15% of the U.S. population even knew about medication abortion. Mm -hmm. That has significantly changed in part because of COVID, but also because of Dobbs. I think it's now running about 50% of people. And the anti-abortion mm -hmm. movement is doing all of it can to stigmatize abortion pills. That's what actually abortion pill reversal is about. It's about saying, you know, they say that they call it chemical abortion. They call it a pesticide. I mean, they have all these stigmatizing language and discourse around abortion pills. They say it's dangerous for women to use. It's not. It's safer than Tylenol. Um, and so finding ways to counter the misinformation about abortion generally, but abortion pills in, in, you know, in particular, um, you know, like exposed fake clinics has a whole campaign about going on and giving negative reviews to these CPCs on Yelp or on Google reviews or on other kinds of websites. I mean, you can do that from anywhere in the world. And it really is a war of attrition. Like they've got so much money and resources. So they're pumping their things up to the top and, and, right, you know, funding right. these ads. The reason that when I search abortion pills near me or abortion near me, the reason I get Clearway Clinic at the top of my search engine is because it's an ad and they got the money to do that. But, you know, we've been lobbying Google and Yelp to try to put in place more, um, you sort of, you know, checks on accuracy because, you know, this is how young people are getting their information. Like, even if you're low income, you have a phone, usually. You have some sort of digital platform. You know, uh, so many young people are there. And so that is becoming real. Even these CPCs are going digital. I mean, everything is now, I mean, it was a result of COVID. Everything went online. Exactly. So you as people abroad have access to the front lines, even though you're not physically here in the United States, you can get on those front lines and put in hours of work, you know, and, and to, to counter that misinformation. So organizations like Clancy Pills and their ambassador program, um, Exposed Fake Clinics, which is, you know, Liz Winstead, she used to be Comedy Central. She started, it used to be Lady Parts Justice League. She's really funny. Um, it's now called Abortion Access Front. She's behind Exposed Fake Clinics. And uh, anyway, she's very hilarious. She was like one of the founders of um, I, I guess it was Comedy Central, I think. She's brilliant. She's very yeah. funny. So she's using humor to advocate for abortion rights. But then there's a lot of other, thank you, there's a lot of other organizations that are, you know, trying to spread the word, trying to help people, trying to counter this misinformation. So that's one idea. Um, I, I mean, there's other- Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's open the floor. Um, anybody else? Let's Let's have a discussion here. Anybody want to join in? Um, I think Carrie, you should take advantage not take advantage of Carrie while she's here with us. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody is Sarah. She, right. Hi. Um, hey. Hi, Carrie. Um, my granddaughter has been part of a national organization of, of Canadian doctors trying to do something to get um, I mean, they were trying to get them to come here or they don't know what to do, but they've met. And I mean, who should they contact to get, give them resources about what they can do here to help people in the States? That is a great point. So Plan C, I know, has been working with doctors in Mexico to help people along the southern border. And so I suggest they get in touch with, um, so it's... Um, it's Elisa Wells and Francine Coito. I'll put their names in the box at Plan C. So um, Elisa Wells and Francine Coito. And by the way, I can get I can provide their email addresses um, to Sally. Uh, so there are doctor. I interviewed. I did an interview with a doctor in Mexico City who is mailing abortion pills to like FedEx offices along the border. So if you live in like the Rio Grande Valley and you want to get abortion pills, you just go right over the border and you can pick your pills up at a FedEx office. And and so there are creative ways. There are also doctors abroad who are mailing like like Dr. Rebecca Gompertz, who's based in um up in uh, in Austria, she's a Dutch doctor based in Austria who has aid access. I think there are Canadian doctors that are thinking about 
beginning to provide telemedicine abortion from outside the United States to people in states, red states with bans. So if you, you know, now it's a little, you know, you have, I know that Rebecca Gompers has been very careful about getting legal counsel and dotting all, she believes what she's doing is 100% legal. She's not violating any laws. Um, and so, you know, I don't know Canada laws, but they would definitely want to lawyer up and make sure, and, and Elisa and Francine can help them with that. But um, that I think is really important. Or, you know, if, especially if they're located along the borders, I mean, to just to go back to that map, there are definitely some of those red states with bans, like Minnesota, uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, not Minnesota, uh, like Idaho, now it's just a teeny bit that borders with the with Canada, but even like Wisconsin, Minnesota bad man is a border. Uh, yeah, no, but Minnesota is legal. Oh, okay. So I was looking at the I was looking at the wrong map, but like okay, I'm just gonna quickly so people that are in um, I'm gonna quickly share my screen again just to show you the map. So like people in Wisconsin, like let's say there were doctors located right here in Canada. People along the northern border of Wisconsin, you know, it would take them forever to drive all the way down to Illinois, but if they could just pop over the border and there were doctors there, um, you know, I mean, if they live near Toronto, it, well, Toronto, I don't know enough the geography of Canada, but anyway, like there might be doctors along that border that could help, or they could send pills to a FedEx right over the border for somebody that lives in rural Wisconsin. So again, just that's like brainstorm of something they might do, but I would definitely talk to Elisa and Francine. Okay, you've given me their, I've got their names. Do I have their contact numbers? You know, um, I'll give that, that to offline? Sally. Yeah, yes. we'll do that offline. Yes. Thank Would you. you give that to me, Sally? Because this I is will, a- I will indeed. This is um, a yeah. conversation. Work, um, it's already, so. So by the way, I see Jacqueline asked how effective is NARAL? So NARAL's going through a transformation. They used to be like a national group with state chapters. And they recently kind of, let go of their state chapters. So for instance, NARAL Mass Pro-Choice Massachusetts is now become Reproductive Equity Now. And they're an oh. independent organization that functions actually throughout New England. And, um, you know, they're still sort of affiliated with NARAL, but NARAL no longer has its chapters. And, you know, they still have the national organization um, that, uh, that I think is doing lobbying in DC. But the state chapters have all become their own organizations at the state level that are focused on state level or regional level issues, like in the case of reproductive equity now. So that's kind of where we are with NARAL. Um, and I think Anne Hessa, um, our fearless leader, has a question. <laughs> I do. I was very intrigued when you mentioned the word international. We know there are millions of American women living overseas and safely accessing the healthcare they need. For example, my daughters both live in Austria and it's yeah. very hard sometimes to, to alarm our, yeah. our community. And I, there are 10,000 Women's Caucus members and most of them have what they need. Yeah. So when you say international, I wonder if there's a way to light a fire under these, these women and the millions of American women overseas. What, what can you tell us about the dangers of this spread. Oh, oh, right. So my, my first reaction is, even if it doesn't affect you personally, don't you still have friends at home, family, yeah, really? you know, nieces and nephews, cousins? I mean, you know, so there's that. Um, if you ever hope to come back to the United States, which maybe you don't, which I would totally understand, uh, you know, this is what you're going to face. But yeah, my point is, is that the anti-abortion movement is international. And a lot of the strategies that they are honing here in the United States, they are exporting to countries across the world. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you know, you saw what happened in Poland, which recently banned abortion. Hungary. I mean, the U uh, Russia. I mean, you know, they are they are making a alliances with these sort of, uh, quite frankly, le you know, fascist leaders that are taking over many West Eastern European countries and, and other countries. And there are strong alliances. I mean, you know, the kind of um, uh, strong man fascist leadership that is rising around the world is occur. It's, it's very integral to that is 
patriarchy and their reassertion of male authority, both in government, but in the, you know, in personal relationships, in marriage, oh. in the home. Yeah. And so, you know, you can look and say, well, it's not happening here, so I'm okay. But it, it is happening here. I can guarantee you, no matter what country you live in in the world, that there is an anti-abortion movement, that there are crisis pregnancy centers that are organizing, and that they are getting support from the U.S.-based movement that is, you know, Heartbeat International, CareNet. These are international organizations, um, birthright organization, not to be confused with birthright that sends people to Israel that it's, it's birthright international it's an anti-abortion organization that creates crisis pregnancies all around the uh, crisis pregnancy centers all around the world um they're they're lobbying uh you know so i i don't think anybody is safe i would strongly encourage that they i mean this is the the right wing fascist movement is a global movement it's a christian national movement it's you know and again i can there's a lot of research on this. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the scholar that I mentioned earlier from Kentucky who's doing this research. Um, I'll, I'll send you information. It'll, it'll come back. You can share it. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. you know, but, um, I was in touch with, um, I was in touch with Planned Parenthood in France and they have an international um, structure. And the woman wanted me, amongst other women, to come speak to the French parliament. Um, it got, it ended up getting canceled, but um, for internal French politics reasons that we're not related to, to uh, women's health care or abortion. But um, as we prepared for the session that did not happen, I, we were all talking about what you just said. There was a woman from Poland, I was from France, someone from Spain. The, they're exporting their funding, not only their yes. ideas, but their funding. Absolutely. Paying people to go on the streets in coordination with the Catholic Church and some other yep. organizations. Yep. So and then their expertise, the strategies they're using here, I was just saying, the strategies they're using here, they're exporting around the world. Exactly. Like misinformation, like abortion pill reversal was developed here, and they're now exporting it around the world. Um, we'll try. Anne and I will try to get them all revved up. Um, but it, it's a good it's a good point. I mean, you know, this the um, concept of sisterhood, which we all knew back when, seems to have dissipated somewhat as long as they're not in direct um, danger of, of having the rights taken away. So we need to build on that. Great. Any other questions for Carrie? Oh, dear. Couldn't have possibly answered everybody's questions. Which organizations, this is Becky in the chat, which organizations are organizing and funding uh, the legal defense for doctors, healthcare providers, and others facilitating abortion access who may be criminally charged, or is it state specific? No, there is an organization. It's called the Repro Legal Defense Fund and the Repro Legal Hotline. It's both run by a group called If When How. I'll pop their website into the, um, so they are one of the groups. There's others. Um, uh, okay, I am gonna just drop. So this is a hotline that people can call for legal support and information if they are um, particularly around um, self-managed abortion, but more broadly. Um, and they have a defense fund, a fund that will help uh, create, um, like if you, I'm just going to drop that to repro legal defense fund. So let me just give you an example. There was a woman before Dobbs happened, there was a woman, um, in Texas who showed up in an emergency room with a miscarriage. She was, uh, accused of, um, uh, murder, even though having a miscarriage is not a crime in Texas. Repro Legal Defense Fund posted her bail. They they had a half a million dollar bail. They posted her bail. The charges were later dropped. But that's the kind of thing. They provide bail. They provide legal advice and legal support for people who are criminalized for pregnancy outcomes or um, self-managing abortion or just abortion generally. I mean, we've seen this around the world where women who have miscarriages are suspected of causing their miscarriages and they're then charged. This has happened for decades in Latin America as well as the United States particularly marginalized women, low-income women and women of color. And this is gonna really proliferate post 
Rowe. The National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers issued a really compelling report in November of 2021 that I wrote a story on about how if Rowe's overturned, that the criminalization of pregnant people is going to really proliferate. And so there's that. Um, and by the way, I haven't said this yet, but I think the most dangerous things about Dobbs is not for women. The, the biggest dangers are for not for women seeking abortion or getting abortion illegally. It's for women carrying pregnancies to term. Why is that? It's because, as you all know, pregnancy doesn't always successfully you know, end, right? A lot of times people have health conditions during pregnancies or they have miscarriages or they need medical support during pregnancy. And as you criminalize women and people who are pregnant for what happens during pregnancy, no matter what it is, then women won't have access to care. The doctors will be hesitant to give them the care they need. And women are more likely to not go to care because they're afraid if they go, they'll get criminalized. Tennessee passed a law um, in like 2018 that uh, basically uh, allowed doctors to test them for criminal, like substances, like substance abuse, and then oh, yeah. to turn that information over to the police. And what happened is women stopped going to doctors when they were pregnant. There was one woman who was fleeing the state. She was in labor, fleeing the state to get out of the state so she could go to a doctor in another state and ended up having to pull over on the side of the road and give birth on the highway. And because of that, Tennessee decided not to, to the law sunsetted and they decided not to renew it. And, you know, this is a really like anti-abortion legislature, but they, they realized that these kinds of laws actually are driving women away from care and they're preventing doctors from be, being able to give women necessary medical care and that it harms women but it also harms the children that they give birth to so i think that's something that people that's a conversation that needs to happen more it's not happening enough and um you know it's just one of the things that i've been been talking about no, but the, the conversation is clearly broader than just access to abortion. It yes. has to do with respect for women, their bodily autonomy, but for their health care in general and post yeah. pre po, po, and post pregnancy. There's yeah. a question in the chat room, um, which I'll read out loud. Some states are making laws to criminalize protest in front of crisis pregnancy centers. What do you know about this? it violates the first amendment <laughs> you yeah. can't you can't criminalize protest i mean that's like one of the foundational course now you know congress has introduced legislation condemning these alleged quote unquote violent incidences at cpcs you know me and my friend so there have been some spray paintings there have been some like you know um people throwing rocks through windows or pipe bombs at a couple, allegedly at a couple of these crisis pregnancy centers. You know, my people think that the right wing is doing that. But, you know, there's allegedly this group called Jane's Revenge that is going around, you know, spray painting and doing things. And so, you know, of course, the real violence is happening at abortion clinics that get, you know, where doctors get killed and bombs, you know, and arson and, you know, all these things for decades has been going on. But, you know, they're concerned about spray painting at a few of these crisis pregnancy centers. Now, you know, if there were bombs that went off at some of these, you know, obviously that's horrible. I would never endorse that. You know, there's never been any proof who did that. But, you know, there, there was a resolution introduced in the House on like the first day, um, along with the like born alive legislation, but there was a resolution to, to like condemn violence against crisis pregnancy centers. I think this is a way overblown, you know, thing that they're, they're trying to say we're the victims while they're victimizing us, quite frankly. I mean, that's just my opinion, but, but yeah, that's... Uh, that's what I think on that. They, whoever screams the loudest gets the most attention, right? And yeah. to scream loud, you need a lot of money. And that's yeah. what they're doing. 
Um, yeah, it's part of the misinformation. It's like when they immediately right. blame January 6th on anti-fascist organizations. You know, it's like, yeah, right. Who are just wearing Trump shirts because they're trying to pretend that they're Trump. You know, right. I mean, they like to, to play the victim and False blame flag. others. Right. Yeah, it's gaslighting. I mean, exactly. the experts are gaslighting. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think if nobody has any other questions, we're going to have to wrap this up. But, um, you know, it's like 630 in Paris or in France. <laughs> We could get a drink and go on forever. But, I wish know. I was in Paris getting a drink with you. <laughs> I know I, I cannot tell you. you but anyway, yeah. oh, Connie Board has her hand up, and we're certainly going to give her the time to ask a question. Go ahead, Connie. Well, first of all, I so admire you. And, you know, we think we do a lot of work about this, but you guys are saving the world. I mean, this is really, really something incredible to hear the kind of uh, underground railroad that you're oper uh, operating for women. Um, yeah. There's one thing that we very rarely see. We very rarely see it from the other side. And I have a friend who is making a film somehow or another. She got herself into one of those mobile units where yes. you go around the country, super luxurious, absolutely fantastic, stopping off, inviting pregnant women to come, listen to heartbeats, watch films, see what a, a, a a, a six-week-old fetus looks like, where it is so torturous for the women to even contemplate abortion because they turn this into, I mean, the publicity is something that weaker women, let's say, have a difficult, terrible time to resist. I am dying to see this film because this is something maybe you know a lot about. Maybe you've seen the kind of propaganda that exists on the other side, but not everybody does. We haven't seen that. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are a number of wonderful documentaries out there. Um, uh -huh. There's one called Delaware and 12th. It's been out for I, I a while. I want to watch one of those. I'd yeah. love to watch one of those. Yeah. So Delaware and 12th and another one called Jackson. So Dela, Delaware and I'm not going to misspell Delaware. Delaware <laughs> and 12th. It's, it's a compelling documentary. And the other called Jackson, and they go inside um, the CPCs and talk to, actually Delaware and 12th is interesting because there's abortion clinic and across the street, there's the CPC. And the mm -hmm. filmmaker goes in and talks to people on both sides and then talks to protesters outside and then talks to the women that are trying to go in, they get diverted over to the CPC. Right. And um, it's really, and even though it's made a while ago, it's still very relevant, but I love, I'm glad to hear there's one, because that's what they're doing. They're going mobile with these mobile clinics. And, uh, and so I think that uh, we need more information about that. I have a friend, Carly Thompson at Middlebury College, who does research on these mobile clinics. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of information out there yet on them. By the way, I do want to just flag, our side is also creating mobile clinics, uh, yeah. Just the Pill, which is a um, Montana-based, excuse me, Minnesota-based um, virtual abortion clinic, created a mobile clinic that's running along the border of Texas in, Mex in New Mexico <laughs> and in other places that's providing not only medication abortion, but procedural abortion as well. So our sides are beginning to use these like bulletproof, huge, you know, like uh, mobile clinics that are trying to provide this care to people. So, um, so that's happening on our side as well. By the way, there's also um, premiere. I'm leaving tomorrow to go to Sundance uh, for a premiere well, of a of a film called Plan C. Um, and I'm just dropping. Oh, that's the IMD. But I, uh, so it's about the organization Plan C and the underground abortion movement in the United States. And I don't know when that's gonna be available um, widely, but uh, look out for that film because it's it's a wonderful film. Francine and Elisa are in it. They interview people that have um, you got pills underground um, and uh, people that are harm reduction organizations who are mailing pills within the United States, You know, but it's harm reduction. So uh, anyway, interesting stuff. Is there Great. another question? Um, I think Diane, our researcher from Portugal, Germany, <laughs> is um, yeah. she looks at all the bills, and so she she has all the worst news possible. But yeah. we'll, we will maybe we'll be able to show Plan C as part of a um, as a new program effort. Um, 
um, what I wanted Diane, to say- Diane, can I get on your email list? Can you send me your oh, email list of bills? Oh, I'd yeah, love to be sure. on your email list because right, we'll it's hard your... to keep up with it all. Oh, yes. Absolutely. I, yes. I had like three months where nothing happened. And now it's just- <laughs> it's Because they are all back in session. Yeah, yes. no, it's yeah. it's intense. So yeah. I, I love that because yeah, so I have a hard time it. keeping up with it. That'd be brilliant. Send your uh, information to Sally and, okay. and she'll I'll make sure it. that happens. Okay. Thank Great. You, Sally. Uh, one Thank last you. thing. This is being um, recorded. And so once the recording uh, link goes out, I'll send it to a, as many people as I can. And my request would be to pass it around. Okay. Get it up on social media. It's on Facebook Live. So that will also be visible. And the idea is to reach out and touch someone. Sorry to quote a stupid ad. <laughs> <laughs> and, it sticks. Uh, it's a great quote. Yeah, it's, <laughs> you get old and very few things remain in your brain, you know, but... <laughs> As advertisements do, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's hideous, but uh, <laughs> this has been fantastic. Um, Carrie, we will be in touch. Um, and I think this is going to be an ongoing struggle, but I think one great thing I love about you, Carrie, is you don't allow yourself to get depressed, okay? We just have to keep going and keep struggling and keep fighting and keep the good news as good news and make that yeah. make it healthy. Um, and so, Diane, I'll get you Carrie's phone um, email so you can depress her as well as me <laughs> with your bills. I'd hate but to there's good stuff alone. too. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and I'll yeah. put you. I'll put you if you if you want me to on our uh, monthly meeting list. Okay. Okay, great, uh, great, great. And also, and I'd like to this. share what one of my friends told me last night at our international club is that you may not be on the winning string. But you're a brick that's letting other people yes, get absolutely. to the winning. And that's what I have to think about when I look at all this shit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I say this to my students because they get overwhelmed and they feel like we got to solve it all right now. And I'm like, we've been at this for a long time. We'll be at this for a long time. You, you're standing on the shoulders of the people before you and your shoulders will be the floor for the people. You know, you don't have to solve the whole thing. You just need to do your little bit and never give up. Because if you give up, you let them win. Well, that's and part so, of our speech. You know, we're trying to get yeah. new members in the youth vote because they're the future. And we have to get them involved so that they know what's going on, irrespective of where they live. Because it's a sisterhood out there. And we're all going to get screwed eventually if we don't do something about it. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank all of you for all the work that you are doing and that you're, you're still thinking about us back here. Oh and, my God, uh, yes. I'm always here if I can help in any way and, and share information. And thank you so much. Just really appreciate being with you today. Thank well, you. You are the best. Thank, you. thank you so much. And thank you. To, I want to thank Sally for, for leading this team. And now, Carrie, you've given uh, us so many ideas. Sally's going to need a team twice as big. <laughs> to make sure she gets it all done. So all of you who are listening, who are not on Sally's team yet, please do volunteer for um, one of our GWC teams. We have several. Our volunteer coordinator is on the, on the call today, and she'll talk to you about where she, uh, you might fit in best. But Carrie, thank you for taking your valuable time for us today, and we really appreciate it, and we'll be in touch. Okay, great. Bye bye. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye. everybody. Okay.